think engineers are just people who, who make things. And about two years ago, I came to the horrifying realization that synthetic fuels are something that we needed to do. Meet Casey Hanmer, the founder and CEO of Terraform Industries, a startup that uses sunlight, water, and atmospheric air to produce natural gas. Well, you need to make more energy, you need to make it cleaner, and you need to make it cheaper. This is not exactly revolutionary, but this is just cheaper, and, and you know, money has this way of finding the cheapest option or the most productive option. You know, as a 18-year-old thought, well, yeah, we should just stop using oil, and then, you know, gradually over time came to realize that just stopping using oil wasn't an option, because most of the world's population depend on oil, and that's not hyperbole. Like, if tomorrow found that we could not use oil anymore, good fraction of us would be dead. I'm Christian and this is First Principles. Today we're talking with Casey Hanmer about the physics and economics of Terraform Industries, a company that is pulling hydrocarbons from the sky. Casey's first hydrocarbon is methane, which basically has two ingredients, carbon and hydrogen. He can get the carbon directly out of the atmosphere from CO2 and he can get the hydrogen directly out of water. So from the raw ingredients of sunlight, air and water, Casey is creating natural gas. It might sound too unbelievable to be true, but the chemistry is actually extremely straightforward. And I think that you'll see in this episode that Casey is not some sort of crazy alchemist, but rather just a really creative engineer. So let's hop into it. This is Casey Hanmer with Terraform Industries here on First Principles. Thank you for joining. And you want to just tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you're building? Yeah, thanks, Christian. It's great to be here. I'm building Terraform Industries. We're producing synthetic natural gas from sunlight and air. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is a very succinct, perfect intro. You wanna, uh, so how did you learn how to do that? Like, I feel like, you know, engineers tend to identify, or at least they make you uh, in, in school, you know, you're a mechanical engineer or electrical engineer or a computer scientist or something, but your background's pretty interesting. Like you've, you've been everything from a, uh, a levitation engineer to working at NASA to uh, now doing what you're doing. So like, how, do, how do you identify as an engineer and how do you, how do you build those skills? Well, yeah, I think engineers are just people who, who make things. And about two years ago, I came to the horrifying realization that synthetic fuels are something that we needed to do urgently and that no one else is really doing it, uh, at least not, not the way that I thought was the correct approach. And, and so I set off to find out what my mistakes were. And two years in, I think I've you know, learned quite a bit and uh, we're a lot closer than we were before. Was the, was the original thing that you did, the paper, like did you start by thinking through it in sort of like written paper form of like, how do I do all these steps and will it actually like, does the engineering study close basically? So it kind of, I knew, I knew even 10 years ago that the key was something to do with energy. But as these things go, you know, uh, often by the time you get to the destination, it, it seems much more obvious than it did along the way. And I guess the ma major intermediate step was that I, I wrote a book about synthetic hydrocarbon. Well, I wrote a chapter about synthetic hydrocarbon supply chain in a book about industrializing Mars, uh, which is, you know, one of my all time bestsellers. And uh, that's, that's a slight joke, by the way. And then, you know, it kind of came to realize that you know, kind of asked backwards that, that energy is the thing that underpins our civilization. We think of ourselves as being in the Iron Age or something, maybe the Silicon Age, but really we're kind of in the hydrocarbon age. Uh, everything that we, we, we see, do, eat, you know, live with, et cetera, depends on, on, on fossil fuels almost exclusively. Well in the majority of our, of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Uh, and so we need to solve this problem. And then at the same time became aware that we were uh, getting really, really good at doing solar power and that solar power was getting cheap enough that, that you could actually, uh, instead of you know, burning fuel to make electricity, you could use electricity to make fuel and, and still not like lose money. And so that was kind of the, the germ of the idea. And obviously the, 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 pre the precise components or the precise details of the, of the technical implementation still had to be worked out. But I kind of started from that perspective and worked my way through and spent probably about a year doing experiments in my garage and reading and analyzing and trying to, trying to get a handle on some of the heuristics necessary to design a process that would work in the real world. It's kind of like you start with this infinite sea of possibilities and you, you have to you know, build a couple of bridges into the unknown uh, so you can think sensibly about it and understand where you, where you need to land. And um, I think we did that quite successfully. Well, what, you became aware that this was a very urgent problem. This is something that needed to happen like immediately. Like, what was it that convinced you it needed to be so immediate? Well, first of all, there's no other way of solving the climate problem, right? Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I was kind of disconsolate and disappointed, as many are, that our political system had failed to solve global warming, you know, through Kyoto Protocols or the Paris Accords or COP26 or whatever. And, you know, as a 18-year-old thought, well, yeah, we should just stop using oil. And then, you know, gradually over time came to realize that just stopping using oil wasn't an option because... You know, the, the lives of most of the world's population depend on oil. And that's not hyperbole. Like if we tomorrow found that we could not use oil anymore, uh, within, within a year, a good fraction of us would be dead. And within 20 years, almost all, as it stands today. And yet we are in a situation where in 20 years time, we better damn well not be using any more oil. 
or we're going to bake our grandkids. So kind of in this impossible situation. But it's it's not just a political problem. You know, like it doesn't matter if you live in a representative democracy like the United States or an autocracy like China. There's no way for a political system to impose you know, abrupt cessation or even a meaningful reduction in the use of hydrocarbons because because you know they get voted out. Uh, they get voted out even in places that don't have elections. They would get voted out as you know autocrats discover from time to time. It can still happen to them. And so instead, the way out is, well, you need to make more energy. You need to make it cleaner and you need to make it cheaper. This is not exactly revolutionary thinking. Um, and certainly we've seen you know, enormous strides in the deployment of solar, wind and, and batteries over the last two years, you know, really kind of hitting the mainstream. And that's basically just that story. Right? Like it's, not, it's not driven by subsidies. It's the fact that this is just cheaper and, and you know, money has this way of finding the cheapest option or the most productive option. But there's still kind of this missing piece, which is, sure, we can electrify the obvious stuff. We can electrify our buildings gradually. We can electrify our cars. I'm sitting in an electric car right now. You know, the vast majority of, of the world's fossil fuels are used on on um, on extremely necessary industries that have very low revenue per per ton of CO2 produced. And you can't just, you know, cough off a thousand bucks a ton to capture that CO2 and stuff it underground when you're done. There's not enough money available to do that. There's not enough wealth in the entire world. So you have to find some way of, of, um, of actually making a substitute drop-in hydrocarbon fuel that's cheaper than drilling a hole in the ground. Unfortunately, this is not all that hard. It's certainly hard, but it's not impossible because, you know, drilling holes in the ground is actually quite difficult. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a, some, some, something of a fair fight. Absolutely. So what, what is it, what's so magical about hydrocarbons that, that made us use them in the first place? Like maybe what, what is a hydrocarbon and then why is it so useful? Yeah. Well, your show is about first principles. So like from first principles, uh, humanity derives energy by kind of allowing energy so you know, derives useful energy by allowing entropy flows to, to be tapped. Uh, and it just so happens that, that humanity lives on a world, Earth, where there's a significant chemical imbalance between uh, certain kinds of minerals that occur in the ground and the atmosphere. Well, I mean, essentially entropy, entropy being stored over hundreds of millions of years by plants. Um, but you know, in, in more plain language, uh, there's a shitload of oil and, and gas and coal underground, and there's a lot of oxygen in the air. And if you bring the two together and warm them up a bit, they burn, and that creates heat. And with heat, you can do... Almost all, almost anything. You know, our bodies create heat, but you know, a couple hundred watts uh, to keep us warm. And as as we run around, but you know, there's just not that much you can usefully do uh, with with that much energy. And we saw that in the limitations of pre-industrial societies and the and their persistent and I think axiomatic inability to to raise all but the tiniest fraction of humans out of grinding poverty. Uh, and yet, once we started burning coal and oil and and gas, actually, it became pretty straightforward uh, to buy almost everyone a, a pretty good quality of life. Uh, by pretty good quality of life, I, I don't mean we're all flying private jets around, but I mean that like most of us have not experienced our children starving to death. That's certainly something that people take for granted today, but was not the case, um, you know, 200 years ago or even 100 years ago in most of the world. Absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely don't think people know that. Like, it's very much a, the bad guy now, right? Like, the hydrocarbons are causing global warming. Uh, but it's true from a first, from a, well, which is true, but from a first principle perspective, it doesn't have to continue to be true. And that's kind of like the, the bet of a company like yours is that there are ways to make these things that don't necessarily lead to bad things that like hydrocarbons themselves are not evil. Yeah. It's just that, you know, when released in the ways that we have released them, they, they do bad things. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, to be clear, like there will still be negative environmental externalities associated with burning or making hydrocarbons synthetically, uh, even through our process, because it's, it's, you know, it's positive some, but, but it's not, doesn't mean there's no ne no negatives and no downsides, but uh, and it's also the case that you know if CO two in the atmosphere did not cause global warming over a very long time scale, actually the the extraction and burning of hydrocarbons, uh, provided that you were you know moderately sensible about environmental impacts, you know not not poisoning groundwater too much, et cetera, et cetera, um, would actually be seen as a as a universal moral good, just as putting cheap food on the, on the table of, of hundreds of millions of Americans is, is is seen as a as a universal moral good, or you know uh, making the internet work better. Is, is seen as a moral good. It's just it just it just happens to be the case that very 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 gradually over time we've built up the CO two in the atmosphere to a point that is uh, beginning to cause problems. Can you, can you tell us a little bit just like what are the steps of the process that lead from raw ingredients to ultimately methane? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I mean, there's there's many ways of skinning this cat. Uh, you know, many 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 ways to start with essentially generic inputs and and end up with hydrocarbons or useful energy products at the end. You know, in our case, step yeah step one from from the first moment we're trying to find a method that is the cheapest, simplest, easiest, most scalable approach possible. And so that says, well, you, know, you want to minimize as much as possible any marginal requirements on the, on the system. So like, you don't want to have to be next to a, a cement plant or next to a coal plant or something. So really what that means is we need to be able to get our water and our CO2, which are our sources of hydrogen and carbon, out of the air. And it just so happens that everywhere on Earth there's enough water and enough CO2, almost the same CO2 everywhere and enough water everywhere. 
to to do this process. And then the other missing ingredient is energy, and you need just a crap ton of energy, just like insane volumes of energy. Of course, we don't think about it this way, but but uh, the energy content of of hydrocarbons is ex- incredibly high. It's um, you know, like gasoline is a similar energy content to a pure lard or something uh, in terms of you know what we do, but but also gasoline is about a hundred times cheaper than food on a per unit energy basis. So we don't we we think oh we put eighty bucks of fuel in the car this week and we put eighty bucks of food into our family today. You know like gee my family's hungry, but actually the car is consuming much much more energy than the family. Uh, it's just cheaper. Um, all right, so to get to the point, um, we have three core subsystems uh, as part of our process. Um, there's a system that captures CO2 from the air. So its job is to take CO2, which is about 420 parts per million, and then concentrate that up to about you know, 95, 98% purity, thereabouts. It doesn't have to be perfect purity, but it does have to be like you know, at least Mars atmosphere level of CO2. Um, and then uh, the, second, the second part uh, takes water and produces hydrogen from the water using what's called electrolysis. Uh, so it turns out if you put enough electrical current into water, you can rip the um, the hydrogen off the oxygen uh, pretty effectively. Um, and actually, that's how hydrogen was made industrially until the 1950s when steam methane reforming took over. And, and then the, the third step is actually quite similar to steam methane reforming, only it goes in the other direction. Um, it's a chemical reactor. It's not a nuclear reactor. It's a chemical reactor that takes in CO2 and hydrogen and uh, and produces methane and also some water as a byproduct. And the really neat thing about that is that, first of all, this is you know, synthetic chemistry goes, this is old technology. It was discovered in 1896. It uses a fairly standard catalyst. It's relatively well understood. Uh, similar chemical plants have been around for 100 years. Uh, and then the reaction products are methane and water. So unlike natural gas, which comes out of the ground and is often contaminated with you know, CO2 and and hydrogen and helium, actually it's a major source of helium, which is not such a big deal, but also like a crap load of, of sulfur, uh, you know, sulfur chemicals and and um, and also light petroleum fluids and, and other things. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of that. So uh, we just condense out the water and, and then maybe scrub out a bit of leftover hydrogen or something and, and we're good to go, which is super cool. Um, it really makes our lives easier. Um, yeah, and then, and then yeah, the, the product out of the, out of the reactor is, is natural gas, which is from a, from a chemical perspective, essentially indistinguishable from from what comes out of your your uh, gas supply in your house, uh, and and you can use to to cook your cook your food or, or heat your house or whatever. Um, the only the only difference is is that like because it came out of the air, there's a little bit of carbon fourteen uh, in it. <laughs> uh, so you know, like like your olive oil or like your food, like there's um with a, with a sensitive enough mass spectrometer, you could tell the difference. But but other than that, it's chemically identical. Did you know that there are companies out there that only make money by selling your data? They're called data brokers, and the data that they broker are things like your name and email and phone number, and even the names of your family members. They literally sell your information to scammers and spammers. They are the bad guys. But luckily, there are good guys, like the sponsor of today's episode, Delete Me. Delete Me is a service that helps you keep your personal information private, and they're actually helping me do that right now. All I had to do was go to their website and fill out a little questionnaire, and they've now removed my information from literally hundreds of data broker websites. And I know that this is anecdotal and it's just me, but I have seen a decrease in the amount of spam calls I've gotten ever since I used their service. You should sign up for Delete Me to help protect your personal data. And as a listener of First Principles, you'll actually get 20% off a US consumer plan. All you have to do is go to joindeleteme.com slash FP20 and use the code FP20 at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com code FP20. Check it out. That's awesome. So the, the other the other component of it though is that you do need energy to begin. Like no energy is free. You can't just like conjure yep. up this from the from the earth. So um, you're getting that energy <laughs> from solar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get the energy from solar. Um, so essentially it's an energy product and and we want to be able to pass through the, the, the pass on you know the cost if you like or pass through the cost or the value of, of that solar to our customers as, as cleanly as possible and that means you know dr- aggressively drive down all the other ancillary costs so that essentially the, the customer when they buy our natural gas eighty you percent know, of the, what they're paying for is just the the solar energy that came in into the front end of the system um, and it just turns out that, that solar energy is the cheapest energy that humanity's ever had access to it's it's astonishingly cheap. Um, to put this in perspective, and again, this is something that most people don't fully realize or don't fully appreciate. Um, I, I, I earlier mentioned that that um, you know, megajoule for megajoule or calorie for calorie, gasoline is about a hundred times cheaper than than even cheap food. Um, but it turns out that, that solar panels 
and you know solar batteries and motors and whatnot uh, about ten thousand times more productive uh, energetically hmm. productive per unit area than agriculture so when we think of energy infrastructure <clears throat> we normally think of nuclear power plants and power lines and and um, gas turbines and stuff but we don't normally think of you know the, the insane industrialized agriculture that, that we do across the United States particularly you know in the Midwest as as energy infrastructure but that's what it is right it's, it's solar power plant in the form of corn and soy that <laughs> uh, they capture sunlight and and converts it into useful chemical fuel um, and that chemical fuel some of it goes into us some of it goes into animals and some of it goes into into plastics and other uh, industrial processes um, but uh, but that's essentially what it's doing it's uh, you know and over the course of a season of growth you know the plant successfully captures you know the equivalent of a couple of millimeters of of carbon um out of the atmosphere which is quite impressive in the sense that it you know it's a living thing that grows from a seed um you know the seed contains a little tiny packet of dna that you know builds a self-replicating you know biochemical robotic machinery uh but on the other hand um it does have to spend an awful lot of the energy that it captures from the sun just staying alive and fighting off pests and not getting too hot and not getting too cold and, and actually relatively little of it comes out in, in useful you know useful biomass for us so um the long and the short of it is that is that you know if you let's say you let's say that like you you have a vision for a, a civilization where 99 percent of the energy is in the form of electricity or or gasoline or whatever and one percent is in the form of food so you know 100 to one you know, pe- people can consume 100 times more energy than they personally eat um which is a pretty good quality of life um uh, then you know the total amount of of land that you need uh, to devote to solar versus to agriculture is not 100 to 1. It's actually 100 to 1 in the other direction because Crazy. Well, perhaps 10 to, 10, 10 to 1. It depends on your climate, right? It turns exactly on where you are, but, yeah. but roughly 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 in the other direction. So so actually still most of your land is growing food and growing plants uh, and some small fraction of your land, usually it doesn't even have to be like arable land. It can be you know desert and brown field or, or swamp or whatever. Can You can throw some solar panels out there and with very, very minimal attention and maintenance, they will pump out more energy in a day than the plants pump out in in an entire season, which is um, yeah, it's super cool. It's tra- if this was not the case, humanity would be screwed, right? If this is not the case, even if it was cheap enough, humanity would not have enough land to put out enough solar power to give us the quality of life that the market demands, uh, and that you know uh, politicians by hook or by crook will not be able to take away from us, um, and, and probably wouldn't want to anyway. Yeah, but, yeah, people so, don't I understand mean, this, but it's super hopeful. It's it's the best message ever. It is. It seriously is. I mean, I think that. Um... I think, yeah, people definitely don't understand that. I think that um, one of the things that comes across, so if you re- if you go to your white paper, like if you read the Terraform white paper and you see like at yeah. the end of the paper or whatever, it says, you know, what we want to do is effectively just convert an amazing amount of land. Like we need to, I, I forget the exact number, but like how much more solar do you want to make? Like some absurdly high number of, uh, or like absurdly high uh, increase in the amount of solar that the world is capturing. Like what, what is that number, first of all? Well, I mean, in terms of like, the amount of solar that the world is capturing, most of it will still be in plants, right? Most of it will still be in agriculture by area. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we're, we're basically, we're prepared to scale up to 400 terawatts. Um, now, 400 terawatts is enough uh, enough energy that we'd be able to provide US levels of oil and gas supply at US current prices or better to every man, woman, and child on Earth, which is probably four times more energy than than humanity as a whole could ever possibly hope to enjoy just from fossil extraction that just isn't enough you know even even with uh the fracking boom in the united states there's just not enough oil and gas underground to give you know the the undeveloped or relatively undeveloped billions in in africa and south and east asia and and south america the same level of energy consumption type quality of life that we enjoy here in america but let's say we can we can obviously do that through through um synthetics and solar and so it's about 400 million uh, of our machines for 400 terawatts is about 2 billion acres of land, which which sounds like a lot, but uh, overall, it's it's uh, roughly equivalent to the total amount of land that is currently under cities or under roads, um, you know, across the world. So that tells you that you know, probably do a good quarter to a third of that just from rooftop solar, if you really wanted to. Um, it probably makes more sense to do it, you know, in the outlying areas of cities and towns. But um, but yeah, it certainly it certainly it would barely barely even you know make a dent. Yeah, like we've in the done it before. We we've done that scale of a project before. Agriculture. Well, I mean, it's nothing like what we do. For agriculture, agriculture, you've got to have like a tractor drive drive within a you know, couple of dozen feet of every point of land uh, that you know, covers multiple states multiple times per season, and then have a couple of crop dusters fly by as well, right? And and yet we somehow figured out how to do that. 
uh, it's much much more labor intensive to grow to grow plants, and the the economic productivity is much much lower um, than than solar. It's again people don't people don't fully understand this, but you know essentially the answer is there. The, the the only complication of using solar power is that you know it's not there at nighttime, um, which is one of the reasons why we're seeing such explosive growth in in batteries in the battery industry. But it's also um, you know if if you're able to build your your capital equipment for your um, if your industrial process cheaply enough, uh, then it doesn't matter, right? You can you can get by on twenty five percent utilization. Like I'm sitting in my car right now, which was probably the most expensive thing I've, I've ever bought, um, and I'd be lucky to use this five percent of the time, and yet I still regard it as a good deal, uh, you know, a good 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 addition to my life. So you don't actually need to have one hundred percent utilization of your capital equipment, provided that it's it's cheap enough that it's not really affecting the the bottom line, it's not really affecting the price that you're handing over to customers. Okay, there are all these different parts. What are those huge parts of the process? Is creating all this solar um but what you want to do with that solar is not just like directly turn it into energy you want to turn it into energy that is then turned into other energy in the form of hydrocarbons and then have people use it so my real question is like why not just use it as solar power like why do we have to go through this intermediate step of uh of liquid into rather than just keeping it electricity yeah it's not either or i mean like obviously we're continuing to develop and by we i mean Humanity has continued to develop solar and, and wind and batteries, but mostly solar and batteries now, um, at a fabulous rate, and that will continue to, you know, basically grow at whatever the bottleneck is right now. It's grid distribution capacity, but in the future, uh, the near future, I suspect there'll be battery availability um, to provide people's primary electricity needs. And also, I would expect to see an ongoing transition away from hydrocarbons towards electricity for applications where that makes economic sense, which includes, um, you know, mostly cooling, computation. Uh, energy generation, energy generation, obviously, like electricity generation, um, and and ground transportation. Um, but at the same time, hydrocarbons um, remain enormously important uh, energy source and also chemical source for you know, major industries. Chemical industries, one of the one of the obvious ones, obviously, aviation, shipping, um, uh, and then a you know, bunch of other different things. So I think it would be wise to expect that um, that we will see pretty steep growth in electricity consumption and production and that will not translate to steep decline in hydrocarbon consumption um i think you could definitely say for sure that like hydrocarbon consumption for ground transportation will probably enter a uh, a decline this sometime this decade uh from which it will not recover but overall hydro hydrocarbon consumption for aviation will continue to rise and i hope it will rise steeply not just because I'm talking my book and my business will be selling uh, <laughs> sustainable aviation fuel, but also, like, if you think of, if you think of, um, like, hydrocarbon consumption per capita, aviation is one of the most intense uses we do with it. And so you're like, well, clearly we should just ban aviation. Or we say, actually, as a, as a function of its utility, a gallon of, of, uh, of hydrocarbons burnt in service of aviation is almost certainly more, uh, more productive or has better better outcomes in your life provided that your basic needs are being met um than a gallon of, of aviation fuel or a gallon of fuel being used to have you sit in traffic or something like that and, and as someone who who uh, is lucky enough to, to fly home to australia you know semi-frequently um you know, i think this this is a privilege that we should we should strive to extend to as many people as you possibly can i think that uh, a good future for humanity is a future where people can fly uh, not not just the richest ten million people on Earth, but but essentially anyone can fly uh, anywhere on Earth multiple times, you know, per year, multiple times per life, and a good many of them at supersonic speeds, uh, which is also extremely you know extremely fuel consumption heavy. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll never get there on on fossils. We'll never get there on fossil fossil fuel. There's just not enough of it. Um, yeah, aviation right now is about two percent of global fossil fuel consumption. Um, so you know maybe maybe we could get to like you know ten x that, so we get to a hundred million people flying routinely. Um, but we'll never get to eight billion on on fossil supply. We have to do synthetics. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's let's shift gears a tiny bit and start and talk a little bit more about like kind of the business side of things, like how the you know basically how is this possible to do? Like, sounds great. Like, let's do it. Like, uh, hey, go build all your solar. But at the end of the day, if it's not producing more dollars at the end of the machine than it took to create the machine, then we couldn't scale it up that high at all. So we can't scale I mean, it all. Yeah, I mean, it's will me punch that, you in the face. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. I mean, I think the thing that's interesting is that, like, like this has just become possible. It seems from me. Like, do you tell me if that's wrong? But it seems to me that yeah, you right. know, solar just got cheap enough. Like, 
the the IRA, the like that just made it possible. The revenue was that much higher from this sort of thing. Um, it doesn't seem yeah, like the it's IRA been will save us, very long. The IRA will accelerate us for about eight years, um, which actually makes a big difference. So an extra decade of emissions right now is about 500 gigatons of CO2, which is, you know, there's about two 2,000 gigatons of CO2, excess CO2 in the atmosphere right now. So like another 500 on top of that is not great. So like the IRA is definitely pulling in the right direction. And, and actually, I should say like for the for the, the historically curious in your audience, um, the synthetic fuels have been produced at pretty large scale uh, for almost 100 years, uh, mostly derived from coal. Um, True. But so you can you can take coal and convert it into gasoline. Um, but you know, essentially, as I said, the chemistry that we're we're using was invented in eighteen ninety six. So it's been possible to to capture CO two and to make hydrogen turn it into synthetic fuel at scale since then. Um, but the 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 limiting factor is the availability of cheap electricity on the input side, and solar has only gotten cheap enough to make that worthwhile in the last couple of years, um, and I think increasingly so in the next couple of years. Um, we're, we're kind of you know two years ago I was like, well, solar right now is not not really cheap enough for us to compete without any subsidies worldwide. I mean, there's, there's, there's a few places on, on the earth where fuel is so expensive that we could make a go of it. Um, but but actually, the important thing to realize is that solar is coming down in cost, you know, 10 or 15% per year. And um, at that rate, you know, you, you can miss on cost by quite a bit this year and in five years' time, nothing to worry about. Uh, and then, of course, that, that cost decline is driven by increased demand. Um and any kind of a learning rate feedback process, and once like large scale hydrocarbon synthesis hits prime time, uh, that will increase demand by about a factor of ten. So the cost declines of anything will accelerate at that point, which is you know it's 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 feedback, right? This is capitalism doing what capitalism does best. Without cheap solar, you know, basically solving the climate problem is impossible. Uh, with it, it is inevitable. You know, like that's the that's the key thing there. That's awesome. So what what is it that has caused the the solar or the cost of solar energy to come down so much? I mean, it's uh, you said I mean you hinted at it, but I'd love to chat about it a little bit more. Which is yeah, like, yeah. it's not like we've invented new chemist or like a new way to make like photovoltaics that's like suddenly ten x cheaper, like ten x more efficient. Like we're actually no. like, what 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 efficiency are you assuming? Maybe like twenty percent or something efficient on a I don't, on a solar I don't actually cell? care that much because um, I buy it by the megawatt. Um, yeah. So. The land is not the expensive part, even though we're using a lot of land. And even though, like, if I want to buy my neighbor's house, it's going to cost, you know, a million dollars. That's just because a lot of humans are around. And, and because, you know, most humans live in cities, we think that the world's covered in humans. It's not. It's just most humans live in cities. Right? And in, in LA, like, you don't have to drive very far and you're like, oh, no one's, not, not only is no one here, no one has ever been here. Like, yeah. going back <laughs> to the first pre-Clovis people coming across 14,000 years ago, like, it is unlikely that a human has ever set foot in this particular patch of desolate, miserable desert, um, <laughs> and uh, and so that's why that you know there's, there's plenty of plenty of land. This this kind of applies across the board, and we're familiar with this in in the context of Moore's law with um, with uh, you know transistors and, and things like that. But actually, any manufactured product, which is to say any product that's produced in a factory, um, the the price. This this relationship was discovered in the Second World War. But but essentially over time, as as production increases, the the, the price tends to come down. Uh, so if you if you plot like the logarithm of of the cumulative production on one axis and the and the price on the other axis, um, then they'll tend to follow a straight line, and the steepness of that line will vary depending on what sort of product it is. Typically, the more complex products will decline less quickly, um, and then the simpler ones will decline more more quickly. Uh, but for solar, it's actually relatively simple uh, to make it, um, and the the learning rate for solar is is probably around thirty five percent. Which is to say, every time that we double production, the cost comes down by thirty percent or thirty-five percent. And right now, we're doubling production roughly every two years. So, which again is like a number that's hard to get your head around. But you know, in twenty twenty-two, humanity deployed about two hundred and fifty gigawatts of solar power worldwide, which is equivalent to one megawatt every two minutes. And uh, last year, we we deployed about four hundred and fifty four hundred and fifty gigawatts, which is almost twice as much. Um, and a little bit of that is like, you know, things getting back up to speed after COVID and so on but like uh if i had to bet i would say that you know by 2030 we will have another year in which the relative increase is more than that relative increase you know i just think that we're we're getting really good at this now and that's so so last year was about one every one minute 
one megawatt every one minute. Um, so anyway, so as as the production increases, as demand increases, um, uh, the cost comes down. When the cost comes down, demand increases. Now, it does not it does not guarantee that that the price will therefore go to zero over a long enough time period. Right? It may be the case that that the price comes down, but but not by enough to induce enough additional demand to cause the price to continue to come down. Right? It could converge. Uh, but in the case of solar, it is definitely not converging. And despite what everyone has been saying about, oh, solar demand will definitely converge this year, I think that it will probably not converge for probably another 15 or 20 years at this rate, uh, which is both terrifying and very exciting. Um, because, you know, if we miss by an order of magnitude, then we'll end up paving the entire world with solar panels, which would be pretty <laughs> cool. But also, <laughs> also like, hmm, is this really what we wanted to do? Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I think I think at that point, it's it's very hard to predict exactly what will occur. It is highly likely, for example, by that point, that um, a lot of the most power-intensive applications will be uh, not done on the surface of the Earth anymore. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we hinted at it before, but do you want to say a little bit more just about like what the IRA is and what it did, like how it accelerated? You said that it accelerated um, the advent of this by like maybe almost a decade, but like why? Yeah. How? Well, so the Inflation Reduction Act contains within it, you know, thousands of different you know, incentives um, that are mostly intended to help American manufacturers reshore production after three or four decades of neglect. Um, and I won't get into the the kind of finer geopolitical aspects of this right here, but um, but one of the one of the little tiny you know dusty corners of the IRA uh, contained uh, essentially incentives of, or um, in product, production tax credits for um, green hydrogen for green electricity and for direct air ca- uh, well, carbon capture, essentially. Um, and it just so happens that our business, the business that, I'm, that I started, uh, is, is involved in all three of those in a way that um, is already extremely economically productive. And so the Inflation Reduction Act credits, which are intended to improve economic productivity, uh, really give us a huge kick in the ass uh, on, that, on, that, on that front. In particular, the, the 45V um, production tax credit for green hydrogen which is worth up to three dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. Um, now, you know, conventional wisdom would have it that that green hydrogen costs between five and six dollars a kilogram, so three three dollars a kilogram kind of lessens the blow a bit. Whereas um, steam methane reformed hydrogen can be as cheap as one dollar a kilogram, so it's like it's still hard to compete on that basis. But you know, conventional wisdom does not take into account the fact that um, that you know cheap you can uh, do something with it. Along. Yeah, and and so we basically said, well. What would an electrolyzer look like if uh, if it was powered by cheap solar instead of if it was powered by like hydro or nuclear power or something? It's actually quite different. Um, and I have a blog post on this. People may be interested to call like yeah, how yeah. to make green hydrogen for one dollar a kilogram, um, which really delves into the details of how you go about doing it. And essentially, you cannot you cannot you, know, you cannot achieve economic like uh, relevancy Break unless even. you're about one dollar yeah. kilogram or less. And you cannot get to a dollar kilogram or less unless your power is cheaper than you know twenty bucks twenty bucks a megawatt hour, ideally even cheaper than that. And there's basically no way of getting to that cost unless you're using solar without batteries. And so, if you're using solar without batteries, you have to have an electrolyzer that's happy with 25 percent utilization, which means not only does it have to be super cheap to build, uh, so that the utilization fraction is okay, you know, amortization is okay. It also has to be happy to ramp up and ramp down without you know too much silliness um, and there's, there's plenty of ways that electrolyzers can get very silly. So um, that basically takes you in a completely different direction than the last 50 years of academic research and, and industrial in development on, on electrolyzers, which, you know, me and the team essentially correctly intuited about two years ago and uh, since successfully built prototypes of um, of electrolyzers that, that follow these new new design principles and that will uh, very shortly allow us to demonstrate uh, green hydrogen production uh, that is competitive with steam methane reforming, even without subsidies. Now you throw on top of three dollar kilogram green hydrogen subsidy, and it, it probably roughly triples our revenue, which is um, makes up for an awful lot of uh, let's say execution missteps, which are almost guaranteed <laughs> in a in a small and growing company. Gives you a buffer. Like, is, basically, it allows us to recover from accidents more quickly or mistakes more quickly, um, which is what we need. You know, that's that's what they're there for. And that's what we're here to use them for. Love it. Um, so that's actually, I mean, that was one of the things that struck me when I was reading those white papers. Was like. 
the you i love that you started I, I think it was that one the one with the section that's like here are things that are very counterintuitive but i will prove they'll, they'll like may become obvious by the end of this paper and one of those yeah. was that low efficiency is actually okay like you don't need to yeah. have super efficient solar cell or like uh, solar in general like can or you tell, easy, yeah can you yeah, can you can you talk about that? Like, why do people normally want high efficiency? Why is it so counterintuitive to that low efficiency is okay? Yeah, well, so traditionally we've converted heat into electricity by like boiling water and turning a turbine, and and as a result, electricity has been quite a bit more expensive per unit energy than than heat. Um, and uh, electricity is also usually seen as a more useful form of energy, more versatile form of energy. Um, obviously, that that kind of we're turning on its head right now. Um, and so, it, so when you look at our system, we have many factors of production, right? Many things that contribute cost to our system, um, and one of those, uh, you know, is labor, materials, land, etc., and also electricity. And of all those different things, they're all getting more expensive over time, as as is the way of the world, except for electricity, which is getting cheaper. And so, if you say, well, how do we capture the upside of cheap electricity? Well, you don't want to invest a whole bunch of money into trying to save electricity, right? You want to actually, you know, invest your time and effort into into productively trading electrical efficiency to reduce your costs across the other axes. Um, and, and in addition, you know, if you have a, a lower efficiency system with lower capex, that basically means you're more exposed to the cost of electricity, which is good if the price of electricity is coming down. Um, and it also means that, you know, when, when the price of electricity continues to reduce, we can pass those savings on to our customers because we're sensitive to those costs. Um, if, if you kind of take the, uh, the other leg of the, um, of the optimization and say, well, you know, electricity is, is incredibly versatile and useful and expensive. And uh, we think that the, the cost floor in electricity for the foreseeable future is nuclear, which is probably, you know, 400 bucks a megawatt hour. Um, then there's no way in hell you can get any, anywhere near a dollar a kilogram for green hydrogen. So we're just going to have to eat that loss and we want to minimize that loss and we plan on operating this electrolyzer for 30 or 40 years, 100% of the time. So you know, we can afford to build an electrolyzer that, that will operate you know, at constant utilization forever. So we only have to turn it on once. Uh, it will never have to like ramp up and ramp down. Um, and you know, we can afford to put you know, a thousand bucks a kilowatt of high efficiency tweaks and unobtainium in there because over 40 years we'll get that money back out. Which is fine, you know, if you're building a, a rig to sit on a, on a on a laboratory desk or something like that. But but we're about, you know, our whole business is is trying to build something that's more economically attractive than than uh, oil wells than you know drilling for oil. Which means we need you know a couple of you know an ROI measured in a couple of years at most. Um, yeah, and so that basically means we can't we can't afford to amortize over twenty or thirty years. We have to get the money out really quickly. So it has to be really cheap. So again, it's like. You know, we sometimes talk about multiple lakes or multiple different solutions, and, and it just turns out that there's like two different stable attractors in this space, and, and really the the stable attractor of like uh, cheap and cheerful has not really been explored uh, for electrolyzers, let alone synthetic fuel. Yeah, so that's so that's like one big, well, that's one third of the solution is the electrolyzer. Is it similar? Is it similar with the direct air capture? Is it similar with the the reactor itself? Like, have you done other things with those two that? That people would yeah. similarly think is kind of counterintuitive or different than people would normally make those those two machines. Yeah, across the board. Um, so again, you know, if, if you're in this kind of energy scarcity mindset, you will try and build a direct air capture system that uses a, um, a, a CO2 solvent material that has a very very low energy of like transition energy, essentially the energy required to switch it from like CO2 absorbing to CO2 releasing state. And um, and this is the correct approach to take if you're in a in a situation where you don't have very much very much power. Um, but actually, like you know, hmm. commercially available direct air capture machines are, are used in spacecraft and on submarines and sometimes, you know, sometimes in um, scuba diving equipment or or, um, or med medical equipment or so on. And these these systems generally do not have cost constraints, at least not meaningful ones, but they often have like really stringent mass constraints, which we don't care about really because it's just sitting on the ground. Yeah, yeah. And they often have volume constraints. I mean, submarines have volume constraints, but we don't care about that either because we're literally, you know, putting this out in the middle of the most useless, worthless land ever known. Um, what we have is is a is a capex constraint. We don't really have an energy constraint either, so um, at least not a meaningful one. Yeah, you know, like we've we've built our DAC system to be very very energy hungry, and it's going to struggle to hit twenty percent of our total energy consumption because the the electrolyzer just is so power hungry. Um, so you know, it's very hard to do damage next to that electrolyzer um, on on the energy budget. So so we basically decided, well, what if we optimize our solvent material not for something that is you know incredibly expensive but doesn't use too much energy but something that actually uses as much energy as it needs but it's really really cheap and uh, that that pushed us in the direction of um of the, what's called the calcite lime cycle which uses the same chemistry as cement um and then that solvent materials you know typically less than 100 bucks a ton uh maybe as cheap as 10 bucks a ton if you if you're in the right place uh which is great because at global scale we need a few hundred million tons of it and so if i have to 
buy a few hundred million tons of limestone for, I don't know, a billion dollars. I think that's affordable on the global scale of the hydrocarbon industry, which is you know, on the order of seven or eight trillion dollars a year. I like to say just over the course of a one hour meeting, you and I, the oil and gas industry will have turned over a billion dollars, um, which is <laughs> kind of cool. Um, Whereas if you if you go into if you kind of go up market on um, on direct air capture solvents, you can go to zeolites or amines or metal organic frameworks, and and some metal organic frameworks cost you know, fifty thousand dollars a gram. So if you're saying okay, well now I need I need a hundred million tons of this stuff, it's going to cost you like five trillion dollars or something. I'm sorry, five <laughs> five thousand trillion dollars, which is uh, <laughs> what's even the next money that I have trillion, yeah, like. Quadrillion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quadrillion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, five times 10 to the $18, uh, which is talk about like log dollars. Um, yeah, exactly. Which is, which is which is a lot of money, right? It's it's really hard to kind of think about a business scale, a, sorry, a business model that can scale when you, if you have you know, materials like that in it. Um, as much as possible, we're trying to use you know, materials and processes where the supply chain is essentially unlimited. So for example, a hundred million tons of, of limestone sounds like a lot, but humanity already consumes about five billion tons per year just making cement. And obviously, <laughs> you know, we won't be consuming a hundred million tons a year. We'll be uh, consuming a couple hundred million tons over twenty years. So it's it, it barely even makes a dent in the um, in the global cement supply chain for, for for limestone. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you say a little bit more about how the director capture actually works? There's like the there's two steps. There's like capture and then release, basically. Um, can you talk about how this happened? Yeah, I, there's, there's also a secret, more complex third step. Um, so, oh. <laughs> um, so it, it's basically a cycle, right? You can think of a calcium metal atom that's that's cycling through the system. It gets recycled over and over again. And actually, it has a friend. It has a, an oxygen atom as its friend, uh, which which sits with so you got calcium oxide, which kind of goes around in a circle. Um, and calcium oxide is better known as lime. It's um, it's actually the lime that's in corn chips when it's like got you know a hint sure. of lime. Uh, it's a little bit of calcium oxide left over from the nixtamalization process, which, which releases thiamine, which is a, an amino acid from from the um, from the corn, so you can digest it. And if you don't have that, uh, then you'll actually get pellagra, which is a vitamin deficiency, which is um, so sorry, it's it's not a it's amino acid. I don't know. Anyway, ask a biochemist. <laughs> um, but um, there's, but there's basically a little bit of calcium oxide left over, and actually there's some in in bagels as well. Um, so. So it turns out you can capture carbon with with bagels. It's also the the main ingredient in cement and in whitewash. Uh, you know, like as in you know, um, Huck Finn, like painting the fence with whitewash. Um, so this chemical uh, calcium oxide, um, you can mix it with water to make what's called slaked slaked lime, uh, which is calcium hydroxide. Uh, and calcium hydroxide is is um, a material that has an incredible affinity for carbon dioxide. Um, so you can basically make flakes. Uh, we, we 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 start off with calcium oxide. We mix it with water, turn it into calcium hydroxide. Then we make flakes with it using a glorified pasta roller. Turns out the Italians uh, hundreds of years ago figured out how to deal with like sticky powders, um, and so uh, make make flakes out of it, which is um, it's just kind of got the right geometric properties for something that has to absorb uh, CO two over time as you blow air through it. Uh, you take those flakes, meaning just tons of and, surface area. Yeah, it's got surface area, and it's also got um, enough weight that it won't blow away. So like a powder will just mm. kind of drift away sure. in, in in the wind. Uh, you put these flakes into a um, absorption bed. You blow air through them. And, um, and actually, the density of of CO two in the calcium hydroxide once it's um, once it's saturated uh, is about a million times higher than the density of CO two in air. So you need roughly like volume per volume, you need roughly a million times more air than you need rocks. Uh, so like calcium hydroxide flakes, which is I call them rocks, but it is rocks. Um, it's a mineral. Uh, so so you kind of have this bed that sits there uh, for like two days as you blow air through it at, at a fabulous pace. And after two days, it's like thin layer, a two inch layer of of calcium hydroxide flakes is is you mostly saturated with CO2, and then you you dump that out and and uh, put it into a kiln, uh, which which heats it up to uh, almost a thousand degrees Celsius, and that and that um, process, which is called calcination, uh, breaks the CO the calcium carbonate back down into calcium oxide, and the CO2 comes out as gas. And actually, the um, calcium hydroxide is also pretty hygroscopic, so it it uh, absorbs a bunch of water from the air as well. So um, so it releases that water, and we capture that as well. Um, or we can we can capture it if we need water. Um, and yeah, so the CO2 comes out through a pipe because it's gas. The calcium hydroxide goes out through, uh, through kind of a, a, a drainage, uh, port because it's still a solid. Uh, and then it goes back into the, into the mixer and turns, turns back into calcium hydroxide. So it's kind of this three-step process of like, uh, sorbent, um, regeneration, uh, absorbing CO2 and then releasing CO2. That's good. I, I love that both of, uh, in two of the steps of your process, your, your wasteful byproduct is water. <laughs> it's very... 
to typically you would um, think uh, yeah is that true I mean, what, the, the other one yeah for the reactor it's also water that what, comes out. water comes water comes out of the reactor as well um yeah essentially all the oxygen that's in the co2 gets turned into water um and then all the oxygen that's in the water in the electrolyzer gets turned into gaseous oxygen and gets vented so like our major waste product is actually oxygen uh like trees we just just dig it just like assholes just releasing oxygen into the air <laughs> how um, dare you yeah and actually in some ways um well, actually, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like chemically speaking, when you when you eat food, the chemical reaction that your body is using to convert that food into energy that your cells use to make you walk around and think think interesting thoughts is it's the same chemical reaction as if you just set the food on fire, right? You're you're basically yeah. oxidizing the food and extracting energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, the oxidization process in your body is occurring uh, aqueously, you know, in in water rather than in, in in air. But the amount of energy released is the same, and, and it turns out that that our process is actually creating a hydrocarbon a methane um essentially taking co2 out of the air and fixing it as a as a uh, in this case it's still a gas but we could turn it into a liquid if we wanted to um and it's basically the same process by which plants uh take co2 and water which is ultimately from the air as well uh out of the air and turn it into uh carbohydrate and not a hydrocarbon it's carbohydrate um it's got some oxygen in there as well um to to make sugars and then you know make cellulose and, and grow um and of course, we we use sugars and stuff to to grow as well. So um, it's just you know it's it, it's our process is more like the the burning the sandwich. You know, it's it's a bit more crude. <laughs> um, it involves it involves temperatures and and chemistries that that uh, plants could not survive, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're able to do it at, with such high throughput efficiency and um, at so low cost compared to plants. What I'm hearing is bagels and sandwiches are key parts of the process. Both of them can uh, can help well, us in they, different ways. They, they fuel the engineer, <laughs> and then the engineer builds a machine, and then the machine. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I had a bagel for lunch. Um, <laughs> there we go. It's fueling this podcast right now. Um, <laughs> yep. This podcast brought to you by Bagel. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit just about you know is it sabatier, Sab- sabatier? Like. <laughs> yeah, it depends how French you're feeling. Sabatier was a uh, he was a French high school physics teacher. Uh, who dabbled in chemistry and um, and discovered this process, essentially using like bike parts, like bike pump parts, because back in those days bikes were like the latest thing, and um, and published it, and then ultimately won the Nobel Prize for work related to this, which was kind of um, using metal That's ions awesome. to catalyze high temperature, high pressure um, synthetic uh, reactions, synthetic chemistry reactions. Uh, one of which he, he did not discover, but was discovered shortly thereafter, is the Haber Bosch reaction, which is used to fix yeah. nitrogen uh, and make um, fertilizer. Which supports roughly half the world's population today. So, like, yay, synthetic chemistry, yay, interwar <laughs> German chemical work. Don't don't yeah. think too much about nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen, nineteen thirty nine, nineteen forty five. Yeah, nothing happened. <laughs> um, it's actually, uh, I will say, there's a fascinating book on that called The Alchemy of Air that that gives uh, <laughs> a much better historical context. And actually, when I was in Germany a few months ago, I was, I was lucky enough to go and visit the plant at Leuna near Leipzig, where all this stuff was first done. It's a uh, it's an incredible place. Uh, Field of Dreams, really, for what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, like how they did it. Oh, they didn't yeah. have stainless steel back then. I have no idea how they did it. Anyway, um, <laughs> we have a master car, and even then, it's still really hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the, the reactor's super cool. Um, Sabatier reactor, Paul Sabatier, he had four daughters, but I don't know if he has any living descendants. Uh, it's kind of hard Dude. to find out. I'm not into French genealogy. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, yeah. What can we'll I... See. What can I help? Oh, what no, can I'm, I tell you about about the? Okay, uh, how can I help you with this about it? No, I mean just, just about um, reactor. So we talked. So we talked about with the other parts of the the other like kind of major parts of the process that there were trade offs that normally people wouldn't make, but you guys decided were possible. Is it? Is this just yeah. kind of like a more vanilla Sabatier reactor, or is it, or is it also special in some way? I would say a, a Sabatier reactor is not particularly special. Um, it's we're basically just trying to do it the cheap way, right? So like, it becomes quite a bit more expensive to operate it much more than about 100 PSI. So we operate at 100 PSI, even though that uh, decreases our throughput, like uh, conversion efficiency. Um, But then we just have multiple stages to uh, essentially take the water out and it shifts the reaction equilibrium further in the direction of the products. Uh, We're also lucky in that our customer uh, doesn't require like 99.9999999% purity um, because natural gas is natural gas, right? It's full of all kinds of crap. So as long as we can hit that that, um, fairly lax purity cutoff, we're we're good to go. yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think we're just we're just building the Gen Four reactor right now. So like, we've obviously learned quite a bit along the way, um, but it's yeah, it's going well, and 
it's, it's 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 like the spooky part, right? The other two parts I was able to prototype in my garage, but the reactor, I was like, I better better hire a professional and then build that because like like it's alchemy, right? You're taking matter and you're transmuting it into other forms of matter, right? It's just like it's it's deeply weird, right? It's like atoms are not really very tangible, right? They're they're kind of abstract, but then you build this machine and you you see you you put in hydrogen and actually hydrogen means makes water in 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 uh, ancient Greek kind of gives gives the story away but you put hydrogen and co2 in and co2 is the oxidizer which feels really fucked up and then <laughs> and then uh then then out of the out of the condenser out comes a bunch of water and you're like oh that's weird like yeah <laughs> something something magical is happening in there and something which i will add we still don't understand like the the process by which the sabatia reaction is catalyzed we we, we kind of have like a very vague hand wavy notion of how it occurs but we don't we don't really know so cool it's amazing that we know. Yeah, it's amazing that we've captured it without really fully understanding it, or like you know controlled it without understanding. In general, catalysis is not really well, very well understood. Um, you mentioned Gen Four. You mentioned that you have the Gen Four reactor. Um, you've been doing a lot of R and D basically to like build up each of these steps, multiple versions. You know, trying to yeah, create yeah. ultimately one final on Gen Nine. Gen Nine, nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So what you want to so you want to increase the, the yeah. cycle time? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Um, so what what is the what is the path to like getting a uh, you know actually tapping it like what do you, what do you call it I don't know hooking up to the pipeline or something like uh, what is it, what the process money. to yeah there you go <laughs> yeah well the next major milestone for us is the end to end demo so um, that's currently scheduled for the end of February which is coming up pretty soon uh, so you know if my team is listening to this you should go back to work um, the but yeah basically the, the various pieces are coming together now which is fun. Um, and this will be the first time we've taken these three subsystems, which which kind of work uh, independently, and then and stick them together, which is definitely going to be a bit of a headache. Um, but you know, we've 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 thought quite carefully about how we're going to do that, so it shouldn't be too much of a headache. Um, and uh, and so that that's kind of a key milestone for us. It's a bit like a static fire of a rocket or something. You're taking all the different systems, you plug them all together. Um, we we put electricity in at one end, and natural gas comes out the other end. We take the natural gas, we hand it off to our our customer, uh, Circle Gas, and they will write us a check uh, for probably five cents for that that volume of gas. But like, you've shown that that you've shown that this is a process that can make money, or that like produces money. Uh, you haven't necessarily shown that you're making you make more money than you put in, uh, which is necessary to put yourself inside the tent of capitalism. Right now, we're still on the outside, <laughs> kind of knocking on the door. Like, can we come in? Uh, but we we're definitely like I think from the end to end demo, the well after the end to end demo, the value prop is much more legible. You know the the unknowns sure. essentially much more comprehensible to outsiders. Um, it basically becomes a question of execution and uh, and scaling up and you know, signing key partnerships and and you know, getting to major revenue and then profitability as quickly as possible. Uh, and we're certainly in a in a tearing hurry to do that. This is not kind of a slow burn. It'll take us another ten years to get to a, a usable prototype kind of situation. This is a um, this is a, like really a lot of brain sweat to think about how we can suck weeks out of the schedule. Uh, over the course of the next ten years or twenty years, uh, because it will every every week saved is makes a, actually quite a big difference on the climate front. Totally. Um, and so, how does it? I mean, how does that actually? The, how does the handoff happen? Do you do you actually tap into some pipe or something? Do you deliver huge barrels full of methane? Like, what is the how, how does the offloading yeah, well, actually so, happen? So uh, basically, like we we think that uh, over the next few years we'll be deploying alongside existing gas production wells. So like Please. in. In areas in California where they're already producing gas from holes in the ground, those those wells are in decline, uh, and so there's um, there's actually spare capacity in the injection systems that that take that gas and then you know purify it and then shoot it into major transmission pipelines, and so we will deploy in those areas and then Good. as those wells continue to decline, we will ramp up production uh, and just basically piggyback on those injection systems, um, and that's probably how it will work in the United States at scale, which is like you know oh, roughly cool. 500 to 1.5. 500 megawatt to 1.5 gigawatt in size in solar installations uh, with you know between 500 and 1500 terraformers uh converting natural gas in the field and then gathering it together in a in a centralized kind of uh, purification and and uh, pressurization injection um hub that then will go into pipelines and then as far as as far as the the pipeline operator or the consumer is concerned no, no change will occur except over time the, the gas will become a little bit cheaper um and I think that's the way to go, right? Like the supply side is the is the it's the way to solve this problem. Uh, the demand side is like, well, uh, we would like you to desire nice things less. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> um, 
on the on the supply side, you're like, well, we've we've we figured out a technology which which can produce more gas more cheaply with less environmental impact, uh, and and incidentally, it's also carbon neutral, which is you know, kind of the the nice to have for the on the climate front, and then just you know, basically grow them side by side. Totally. Um, do you want to do other chemicals over time? Yeah, definitely. Um, so natural gas is just low hanging fruit for us, but you know, ultimately we're, we're there to serve the market for synthetic hydrocarbons and. And sometimes when I'm feeling cheeky, I say, you know, there's actually a lot of research being done right now on, on essentially taking the same input, CO2 and, and hydrogen, and making all kinds of other chemicals, including, you know, formate and um, and uh, you know, proteins, fats, and starches. So it may be the case, actually, that in, in 50 years' time, it will not be the case that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, 1% solar and 99% uh, agriculture, but actually, like, a lot of the, um, a lot of the agricultural land will be, will be allowed to rewild. Uh, and we'll be able to produce the vast majority of, of humanity's caloric intake, including like animal feed, uh, premium synthetic foods, et cetera, uh, using, using a solar-based process, a solar PV-based process, which will be easily 100 times more productive, um, probably more like 1,000 to 10,000 times more productive per unit area of land, which both, both means we can increase food supply, reduce cost, uh, reduce, reduce you know, climatic risk, reduce ecological impact, uh, improve quality, uh, and then also vastly increase the supply of food available even in places that we would conventionally regard as unfarmable or inhospitable. Um, so, you know, if your vision for humanity includes, you know, a, a trillion humans on the earth, there's no way we can get there with agriculture as we know it today. Uh, but we could certainly get there with a solar synthetic, uh, you know, supply chain for, for all forms of chemical energy. Love it. That's a perfect way to end. I mean, I, is, any final thoughts, any, any places you would want to send people things you want them to maybe check out that book, Alchemy of Air. Uh, what else should people Alchemy do? Of Air. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're super smart and you want to work with me, um, that's great. And if you're super smart and you don't want to work with me, you should start a company uh, and compete. And uh, we look forward to look forward to the look forward to the battle. But um, but yeah, actually, this kind of cheap solar is is poised to revolutionize about half a dozen to a dozen different industries. And I know a few startups in these areas, but but you know they would all appreciate the help. So um, look around at the local you know incredibly power intensive industries. Think carefully about how you would run them off intermittent but incredibly cheap electricity, and then go and do it. Um, and yeah, the sooner we do this, the better, I think. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.